Um, yeah. Do you know what? Been recording a few different episodes recently, and I'm like always just trying to find interesting people to have conversations with. They could have a job. They could like specialize in a certain thing, or they might just have an interesting story to tell about their life. And actually, I do want to throw this out there too. If you know anyone that's got like a super interesting job or has a really interesting story to tell, um, check the description. There's an email address that you can contact Shilla um, with and like get in touch and like let's have a good reasoning. I had a really good reasoning uh, with a lady called Taban Shoresh and... Yeah, it was different. It was different. I felt like it was a really important conversation to have, especially on the Kurdish genocide. Trust me on this one. Um, it's different, but it's very interesting all the same. Um, if there's anything that you would like to see as well, let me know. Please do. Your feedback is always welcome too. Enjoy. Absolutely. What, this? This is all I use. Okay, good. Gen like, genuinely, this is like... I've got a facial skincare regime now. I I've had one Do from... SPF? No. That's like the main thing. What is that? And sunblock. No, nah, I don't do that. No, Anti, do yeah, it's good for you. You have to. Because people with dark skin, they don't need it, but you do. Yeah, I don't really do that. You'll glow. I only learnt that when I was older. Yeah, I was like, oh, we don't need it. I never get burned. Yeah, I mean, like, I know it's funny, like, sometimes when I'm in Jamaica, I hear people say, oh, yeah, use your SPF and all of that. And I'm like, but what? Like, why? And then I'm like, then people say exactly the same thing. Oh, my God, you need it because... And, like, your skin will just be, like, blemish-free and gorgeous. But my skin looks pretty good still, though. <laughs> you know what? To be honest with you, I was using the same cream for my body on my face for a long time. Men do these yeah. scary things. Like, my, co my cousin has... Like three in one, like shampoo. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and body wash. And then, but like, when I know, it's like, I'll use it. And I'm like, no. My grandma, I mean, back home, we've got this olive soap. Olive like, soap. It, it's that's just made from though. olive soap. Oh, wow. That's that's the only thing she's ever used in her life. Just for body and face. For everything: body, face, hair. Uh, and hair she does look well. quite good for her age. I have to yeah. Say. See, sometimes it's just the simple things. I bet yeah. that's expensive though. No. Well, if you sold it here, it would be. Yeah, if you sold it here, yeah, it would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe I should bring yeah. some back. Bring some, exa <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, hello. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. Yeah. Yeah? Excited. Excited? Yeah. Have you seen Have you seen any of these before? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've been watching You start doing your episodes, research yeah. and whatever else. Yeah. So that means that sometimes you might have seen us having some outrageous conversations. I hope not. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I hope I've seen not. some of them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's I'm open. It's funny because it's like sometimes I have so many different types of conversations that when people say, ah, oh, or when someone says, oh, do you know what? I'm going to go and have a little look at, at what you do. I think, wait, what are they going to go with? What Which are they gonna one see? have you looked at? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are they going to see? But you know what, though? <laughs> There's someone somewhere in the world that has stumbled across this podcast for the first time today and they're seeing me have a conversation with you. It's going to be a great one. <laughs> How does that feel? I'm excited. Yeah. I mean, it's really strange when I have these discussions because I can never sum up my life right. in one kind of box. Right. I've been really, it's been very hard to kind of put me in boxes because I've got so many surreal experiences that when I end up talking about them, by the end of it, I'm I'm almost like, what? Yes. yes. How have you kind of got through that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's like, I kind of want to talk to you because you've had an, you had an, um, a very interesting life, but also have come from something that like, I think for me, I spend a lot of time, if any, if I'm being honest, like I spend a lot of time really deep diving in my culture, um, whether it be music, fashion, or just life. Um, and then also like my family heritage and stuff like that. And like, you know, maybe looking a lot deeper sometimes into like black history and, you know, some of the things that have happened on, on that side. But I don't necessarily take too much time looking outside of that. And that is something that I do 
want to do because there's so much things that are happening there's like there's, there's so much people that are going through so much different types of things and i think also as well a lot of us have a lot more in common than we like to believe at times yeah. too yeah yeah um but i kind of wanted to just have a little deep dive into your experience and and what you went through so what i want to do is i want to start like this let's help me to paint the picture of your life and your surroundings from the early age of four. Okay. So I think for me, a lot of what I do and a lot of parts of my life kind of goes back to then. So I'd have to kind of go through the whole detail for you to kind of get the context. I want to know, every, let me tell you something. I want to know <laughs> every ounce of it. Okay. okay. Yeah, I want to know everything. So we start with, I'm Kurdish. Right. Um, and being Kurdish, I think we are, well, not, not I think, I know we're the largest nation state. Um, we're the largest ethnicity without a nation state. So there's about 40, 50 million of us worldwide. And the Kurds were kind of split between four main states. So Iraq, um, Iran, Syria and Turkey. And there's some in Georgia as well. Um, and that happened during the colonial periods when the Brits went in and started carving up states and nation states without considering the indigenous people mm. to the region. Um, and when I say indigenous, we are completely different. Like, I'm not Turkish, I'm not Arabic, I'm not Persian, I'm Kurdish. Like, it's a completely different language. We've got different cultural history, different roots. Um, so it's very, very different. And I guess where it comes into my story is that my dad was a political activist. He was also a poet, but also a freedom fighter, so a Peshmerga. And I'm from Northern Iraq, Kurdistan. So it would have been under Saddam Hussein's um, regime. And the way that they would try and capture these men who were politically active was by basically capturing the families so my childhood what did my childhood look like it kind of looked a lot like spending a lot of time with my extended family so my mum you could almost classify her as a single mum because my dad was always fighting in the mountains so he was from the moment we were born or the moment she was married he was always in the mountains um and he was with the Peshmerga fighting or writing poems and invoking people to kind of uprise and so she was a working mum, but she looked after us. But we stayed with our grandparents, so paternal parents, his parents, and then my mum's parents, and we'd kind of swap around. So I grew up around a lot of extended family members. Um, I'd say an absent dad, even though he was barely, you know, fully present and still around us, but he wasn't physically around us. So he was away part of the cause. So how did how did you communicate with him? Did he, did uh, he just come back and... It blows my mind. I don't even know. In this day of, you know, internet and social media and smartphones, I don't know how they would do it. But they did it through letters. And they did it through... They had, like, an underground network. Um, radio stations were massive. So they had, like, private radio stations where they would communicate with each other. But most of the messages were sent through friends. So so-and-so would send a letter or something mm. round so the me that's how the messages got through so my mum was working and she'd go and spend time with him in the mountains um but lie at work and say my kids are ill or someone's had time off and when she'd come back she'd be interrogated by the secret police you know where have you been why did you take the day off and she kind of had enough of that and decided to leave her job and just left her job and the day after she left, um, they came to the secret police, came to my grandparents' house. And I remember I was playing in the garden. Like I was literally my mum, my grandmother's garden. I was playing in the garden and there was like a loud thud at the garden gates and it rattled against the concrete floor and it startled me. But I froze to see what adult was going to come out. And my uncle came out to open and I ran to him thinking it was like family and cousins and extended family members um but when he opened the door i realized that it was two 
Iraqi soldiers just standing there and they asked for my mum and my uncle knew exactly what this is for um he tried to kind of deter them from the situation and said she as in my mum has left him my dad because of this child and kind of patted me on the head and they looked down at me and went oh so this is the enemy's child as well and at that point he kind of knew oh shit I what have I done mm. <laughs> I've kind of put her in it as well and so they were persistent and asked my mum to go into questioning and she caved in but as she went they kind of pushed me along and said we'll, we'll take her as well so this is when I was four and you, was your dad at this time was your dad in the hills oh yeah yeah he was he was in the mountains I mean nobody knew where he was but he was fighting in the mountains um and then when they opened the doors uh my grandparents were there so my paternal grandparents my dad's um, mum and dad and they took us to like a I'd say, I call it a main prison because it was everyone there, like all sorts of criminals. And like, I do remember walking in and people just staring, trying to figure out who, who are these people that have come in and they've got a child. Um, and they tried to interrogate the adults. Like we were all in one room and, you know, trying to get as much information out of them as possible, basically. And nobody, you know, gave anything up. Uh, my mum's quite strong and she just kind of resisted. Uh, my grandparents as well. And so after the interrogation, they said, um, they took us to another prison, but I don't call it a prison. It's more like a, it was like an ethnic camp because it was only for Kurdish people that were part of the political movement. And you had the women's, women's quarters with children, and then you had the men's quarters. Now, when we were driving, um, when we were driving halfway through, Kind of put on uh they stopped and got this 18 year old boy who's blindfolded and at that time you had a lot of young men being killed quite instantly and executed and he was blindfolded and all he kept repeating was please don't kill me please don't kill me what are you gonna do to me to like the soldiers um and my granddad was trying to kind of console him, to reassure him. Obviously, we, we knew what his fate was going to be. Um, and they stopped, took him off, and we never saw him again. So he was definitely executed. And when we arrived in the second prison, I remember kind of coming out of the cars. And I was holding my grandmother's hand because my mum was in shock. She was in complete shock. Not only was everything kind of falling around her, she couldn't believe what was happening, let alone going through something like that with your child and then having to leave another child. Um, so we walked into the prison. My grandfather was separated from us and he was taken to the men's quarters. So when I walked into the women and children's quarters with my grandmother and mother, and when we walked in, this is where I always remember kids will always be kids and they'll notice all the childlike things. We walked in and we had like a rooftop. The rooftop was gated, but then you had an area where the kids had gone up and I just could not figure out how those children had gone up there with no stairs. I couldn't see any steps. What was this like? Yeah. Like just a, a, a vertical wall. Basically. So you had, so if, say, a room like this, and then you had a little rooftop there, but then before it was covered, you could go onto the rooftop. Okay. Oh, like right. it was a courtyard area. Yeah, yeah. And I just couldn't figure it out because there was no stairs. and But all the kids were there and playing. Um, and then the next thing I realised was how packed it was. It was absolutely packed with women and children like all back to pack no space for anyone mm. and then i then the third thing that i remember is like the stench of urine yeah because the bathroom was open but it was almost kind of mixed in with everything it was like an open bathroom space you can kind of smell it it was there and for me like even now if i walk past somewhere like an alleyway or somewhere where i can s smell that stench it just automatically takes me back to that moment. It's so surreal. But that smell was very, like, it's strange how smells take you back to certain time 100%, frames. 100%, yeah. Is it like, smells can be exactly like music. 
Yeah. Like you can like see like with a song, the moment you hear like you can hear the first second of it, and it will take you immediately back to a certain place. But smells do that as well. It could take you back to someone. It could take you back to a place, or it could take you back to a feeling, which yeah. is really interesting. It really, I mean, <laughs> it's pretty unfortunate it's that smell, but yeah. that smell just will automatically take me back to that because we had to kind of live in that condition until we were, you know, we were there for about two to three weeks. And then after two to three weeks and family names were called out and we were on that list, we thought we'd be released. Everyone thought we were being released. Um and other adults were kind of going, why are they being released? Why are you taking them? Why are they being released? And so when we went out of the buildings, that's when all the adults started wailing and crying and screaming. I didn't, I mean, I was only four, so I didn't really know mm. what was going on. I was just watching what the adults were doing and kind of picking up on their energy. Mm. Um, but I could tell it was something scary and dangerous. And they had like the buses, but also diggers. So at that time, the way Saddam Hussein, there'd be many forms of death or torture, especially during the genocidal campaign for Kurds. And this was one of them. And it was um, basically to be buried alive. What they would do is they would kind of herd everyone, make you see the diggers so you know what your fate is. So by the time you drive to dig the hole, you know exactly what's going on. It's part of the torture. So they would dig the holes and then they lie everyone down in that hole alive. Like it's not, you're not killed, you're completely alive. And they would shuffle soil over you very, very slowly. So it's a really slow, torturous death. And Iraq is actually one of the highest places with missing number of people because of so many mass burials. Like there's so many mass graves there um, from all the different types of wars. So that's what, when we saw the diggers, I didn't know that, but the adults knew that we were going to be buried alive. And all those cries and screams and wails, as soon as they went onto the buses, it just turned into like silent prayers. So everyone was reciting like the Quran and you could hear the whispers and they were silently praying. So you're almost going into your death. Um... This is where I'm like, okay, I've definitely got someone protecting me because I do believe in miracles because halfway through the buses stopped and something must have, some sort of deal must have been made outside. And when they started driving in, it stopped, but the doors opened this time and it was two Kurdish men. And they said, we're Kurdish, we're not gonna kill you, but you need to disappear as if you're dead. Cause if you're caught again, you'll be killed on the spot because you're meant to be dead already. Um, so at that time, you had Kurdish people working for Saddam Hussein who were actually working to rescue Kurds in situations like that. Obviously, he didn't know that. No, 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 he didn't. But then you did have Kurdish people working for Saddam Hussein to kill Kurds as well. Right, so we had course, experiences yeah, yeah. of both. Yeah. So this particular one was the ones that saved us. And when they let us go, we... My, I went to, so our family kind of reunited, my grandparents. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, do you know, yeah, this is, that's mad. It's crazy. So, I mean, you wouldn't, may not be able to answer this, but you can just speculate. But like, okay, the doors open and then someone says, disappear, like just leave. Yeah. But then like, how do you know whether to go left or right or back or forward or... Because which in whichever direction you go, you could be captured again. Yeah. How do you even know how to get home? <laughs> well, listen to the next bit. It'll, it gets it gets even more surreal. Um, we found. I mean, the only way that you could go is to kind of find your way to a road. So we found our way to the main road, and my granddad stopped a taxi, which happened to be one of his old students. Wow! Which was so surreal because. He's there going, what are you doing in the middle of nowhere with your family? What did your granddad used to do? He was a teacher. Oh, he was, yeah, like what what type, just... Well, back, like in Kurdistan, in his generation, teaching would be you teach everything. Okay, fair. Okay. I mean, he specialised in the arts. He, he loved arts, but 
he um you kind of teach through all the grades like once you're a primary school teacher you kind of teach everything fair but he was so one of his old students just completely baffled but you didn't know who to trust and who not to trust so his response to him was just please don't ask any questions just sneak us back into the city that's all we need um I don't know how and how the journey happened, but I do know that we didn't go back to my grandparents' house, like my mum's parents, because it's the first place that would be searched. 100%. So my <coughs> mum has, like, she's got stepbrothers and stepsisters. So we went to her stepsister's house, so my auntie's house. And when we walked in, they were all wearing black. They were crying. They were basically having a funeral for us because the last news that they'd heard was they've been buried alive because that we went on the bus to the digger and that's all they've heard like i mean there's a deeper story of our uncles trying to follow us and they kind of followed us to certain route and then couldn't come any closer otherwise they would have been caught as well mm -hmm. so they just saw us drive into the distance and so for them that was they've been buried alive they're dead so they went back and told the family they've been taken um, so they couldn't believe that we were there and alive. Um, but somehow, I don't know how, but it must be through underground networks and radio stations. The news had kind of got to my dad and my dad had told my mum she needs to leave immediately. She can't stay in that city. And so my mum decided to leave my brother because they didn't really know he existed because they only took me. And, but we're like home birth, so it's not really like we're on paper. Okay. Um. So she said, well, if, if anything's going to happen, then at least he can, he can kind of survive and we're the ones that would be caught. Cool. But she decided to take me and we went to the south of Iraq, which is Arab populated in Duania. And, we ha and she had a stepbrother there. So we stayed with my uncle and I couldn't go out because I only speak Kurdish my mum speaks Arabic, so she was fine. So I was housebound for about three months. I was not allowed out at all. I wasn't, like, no one was allowed to see me because um, I'd give away the fact that we're Kurds in hiding. Yeah. Um, I remember fighting a lot with my cousin then because I think I was going crazy just being indoors as a child, four-year-old. Um, but you soon learn. You just learn so much about danger like you're taught when to be quiet when to not move when to hide when to stay still when to not say anything because you know you're told the soldier's coming be quiet hide you know so that has been really ingrained from a very young age and anyway three months of that and my mum put her foot down and said i can't take any more like we need to leave the country and we decided to pick up my brother and start our journey to basically going to Iran because that's when that's where Kurds were going to safety Iran was taking Kurds in can I just like just because I just want to just go back just a tiny bit just hold that thought there quickly though see with like all of those other people that was just there waiting they would have all just most of them would have died or being buried um, alive? We know some. I mean, for example, and my mum still carries some guilt from this, but when we first went in the prison, my mum had to literally fight for us to have space. And because some people had been there for longer, they were very territorial about the space, as in, we've been here longer, this is our space. And there was three three sisters in particular that were very... They almost ran the place. And she had a physical shouting match with them to try and get space. Um, we found out that they were killed. Mm. So they, they were part, part of the group that were let go, but then they were caught and they were killed. Um, so there are a lot of people that that would have been killed that we don't even know about. What was like... What was Saddam Hussein's actual plan? Was it just, you know what, I'm going to kill anyone that just opposes my beliefs and what I want going forward? Or was it just like, 
we just need to eradicate as much Kurds as possible. It was, I mean, so if you, if you look at his kind of ideology, the Ba'athist ideology and what he wanted and his ambitions in the region, it was pan-Arabism. Right. So it was pan-Arabism was to replace all the Kurds with Arabic people. So it was happening, you know, in the cities, you'd have, you'd have villages and cities all the Kurds would be pushed out and then they'd be replaced with Arabic people. So pan-Arabism was part of the ideology and the mission. Now, any Kurds that kind of went, no, I'm a Ba'athist, I'm fine, I'm with you, he'd, he'd you accept get a blow. them. Yeah. yeah. But you hardly find any Kurds saying, I'm Arabic and I'm a Ba'athist. <laughs> like, it's it's just, I'm Kurdish. There's I can't be Arabic. So did that replacing always look like... De- well, basically deaf or just black yeah pushed to a side where it was like well you can have this bit and it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller yeah so your rights are completely diminished and so the Kurds in different areas have completely different experiences we all have a sense of struggle and oppression that really binds us for example in Turkey at the moment I mean Turkey won't recognize Kurds as Kurds they call them mountain Turks mm. Like, you know, in Iran as well, like there are so many situations where that is still happening today, not 30 years ago when I was facing it. The only difference with Iraqi Kurdistan is that with Saddam Hussein, you remember the 1991 war Mm. where kind of Saddam invaded areas and then they created a no-fly zone in Mm. the Kurdish area. That no-fly zone was created by internationals, um, UN, NATO, and you name it, and they kind of drew that line and said, you can't fly past this zone, you leave the Kurds alone. That's when the Kurdish region were able to kind of form a regional government. So in 2003, when the the second, um, the other Iraq war happened, the reason why the South kind of almost collapsed to looting and it's kind of behind in terms of development now and why the North, the Kurdish region, was completely protected and safe and kind of flourished is because we had our own security forces. Like, But from since 1991, we were kind of protected and we were able to form our own regional government. Like, We still face that oppression, but it's not as... It was when Saddam was alive, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It's under a federal Iraq, so we've got more rights and more, we've got more autonomy, more rights. But if you go to Kurds in other countries, no, they're still facing genocide. Turkey's a great example. But, you know, it's, but the fact that we're Kurdish has always bought that sense of being oppressed and having your rights taken away. Mm. Why, like, but why? You see, like, he like he wanted pan-Arabism, yeah? Am I saying that right? Yeah. Why, though? Like, like, what was his, what was his actual, what was his belief? Like, was there, like, a, like, a super deeper, you know, thinking or belief system or, so, like, why? I mean, I... <laughs> I personally believe most leaders in the world are psychopaths anyway. Like, you've got to be of a certain thinking to really, really be that cruel and have zero emotions with it. Like, I think the cruelty of what he made people go through... A lot of people ask me, are you happy about the 2003 war? And I'm very conflicted because, of course, I'm not happy about a war. I don't want any wars to happen. I'm happy that he's gone. You know, if he'd have not gone, his sons would have come in power. Like, the succession would have just continued and continued. Um, As to why, like, from a political perspective, if you look at the region, it's all about power, gain, control, money, oil. Mm. Um, If you're going to the roots and historical roots, you know, Britain has a big hand to play in that. Mm. (laughs) You know, it's... Is it's a lot of historical things, but if you're looking at it from like a personal being perspective, I don't think I'd be able to explain that because I wouldn't be able to understand how 
so someone can be so cruel and so hungry for power to be able to do the things that they've done um yeah i i i i wouldn't be able to tell you yeah i mean some people i, I could imagine that people just lock into whatever it is that they feel and then don't see people as like people they just see them as an object that just gets in the way of things so you're able to they're probably very good whichever what term you want to use at compartmentalizing the emotion and the, the the fact that this person or these people actually have a family i think do you know what to be fair like People do that in so many different aspects of life anyway, maybe not so extreme, mm. but sometimes like, I think, and this is not to point a finger at anyone or anything like that, but sometimes like we see, you might see a homeless person on the street and you sometimes just see like a homeless person on the street without actually thinking, you know that they actually all got a mum and a dad yeah. and like a family and like, you know, and something happened but there's like a whole story and a whole lineage actually because their mum and dad had a mum and dad and you just don't really see that. You just see this as that. Yeah. And then if, if there's a, a, a certain type of game that you want, you don't see, you just don't have no feelings towards that. You just yeah. see that person as a complete object. You know? Yeah, and Saddam, like if you look at his history and how he was kind of came into power, you know, the, the way that he came into power, he, he it's almost as if the moment he got the power, and most people in power are like that, they're too scared to lose it, so they'll do anything, anything. to protect it. Yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. And he had 30 years of like being one of the most powerful men in the world, but also living in like the riches of riches. His toilet and his bathroom was all made of gold. Yeah, yeah. Everything was made of gold. And then at the end of it, he was found in a ditch yeah, hiding. Yeah, mad. I know. Like, how does Do you life... know, like, I didn't I have, much, like, a major understanding of, of what was going on at the time. I had a good, decent understanding. But it was like, I remember just looking at this Don in a hole. And I was like, rah, like, at the end of it all, look at this. Like, look, look, look at you. Yeah. Like, it's mad. That's what I mean. Whenever I think of karma, I just go... Karma's very patient because at the end of the day, he he enjoyed so much for 30 years. And at the end of it, he was found so scared in a hole. And you know, some people would have sympathised. Yeah. Like some some people would have looked at him in a hole and saw an old man with a, yeah. a grey beard and thought, oh, just looks like my granddad. Like, oh, yeah. I just, and you know, he's yeah. got this, he had this sad look on his face. Yeah. And he was like, you can see he was like proper petrified yeah. to a degree. And it's like, you, then you see that and you almost forget all of the mad things that this Don did and caused and just look at an old man yeah. in a hole. He was hung and I, I don't, well, I don't know if this is going to be controversial for many people, but Say I, don't, I don't believe in, you know, um, that kind of punishment. I don't think he should have been hung. I think he should have stayed in prison and really just confronted his demons of what he's actually committed and what he's done. Um, yeah, I do remember watching it going, mm, yeah, I know no, he's, I hear he, that. I, he's done a lot to me, but I don't think he should be hung. Yeah, no, I hear that. I mean, that, this is this is a whole other conversation, but like, I, I'm, I, I kind of share the same thing. I'm like, I don't, unless, unless it's hard for me to agree with like taking somebody's life like that unless in this moment right now you are presented with me with a direct threat which means that it's either me or you then i understand it that's defense right but when it's like if i've captured you if i've captured you and i can put you somewhere then I think that's more of a conversation for me more than like the hanging or the injection or yeah, the yeah. whatever else, but yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of people didn't feel like they got justice in that I think he was only charged with a hundred and something deaths. And they're going, what? Yeah, it's mad. <laughs> you know, the crimes that have been committed. Um, Can I say as well, like, obviously this is, 
I might, I, I might even take this part out to be honest with you, but I'm just going to say it anyhow, how I'm, I'm thinking it, but like, in some way, with all of what he actually did, the hanging part of it is trigger warning. The hanging part of it is like a bit of a, it's like a, a decent escape for him because obviously no one wants to go through something like that anyway, yeah? but if it was going to be anything, if it was going to be anything, then it should have been the same, we're going to put, um, dig a hole and you're going to lie in it and you're going to go through that element of it, if anything. But even then, all of that is just all mad. I mean, uh, I'm just like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But yeah, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, there was... <laughs> They're even worse tortures. I mean, this could this could go into a different direction, but torture yeah. is nuts, though, isn't it? You know, it's when you crazy. think about like, was it, was I not saying this to you? I don't know if I was saying it to you, but I was thinking like, how do people even come up with the things that they actually do? You know, like some people do. You like, for example, you know, they might get one man's arm and tie it to a horse, and then get another man's arm and then tie it to a horse or the, but a horse's leg, and it's like. Wait, who, how did you wake up and think one day to do that? Like, do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, I would never think about, yeah, like, you know, this, if we tie someone's leg and just let the horses, you know, like your mind has yeah. to work in a certain type of way to even think like that. There's, you know this, I think there's a lot, lot of cruel people in the world. And it's, I mean, just living up, living in or being brought up in a region where we've just, I've always conflict like even that conflict even when we were fleeing from after hiding yeah we had Saddam Hussein's regime chasing us but it was during the Iran and Iraq war so the only places we could hide was the rural villages and most of them were deserted and you'd have like fighters in there so you'd have one family my mum me and my brother stuck with a group of fighters who are just kind of caught between fighting and then you've got bombs dropping around you from the Iran and Iraq war and when you've kind of grown up in a region where you've only ever known conflict it's it's surreal the kind of things you kind of become desensitized to when you hear it like the forms of torture that some people have heard and experienced I'm not the only person all Kurds have experienced something Someone in their family would have seen or felt or known something that's gone on. And it still happens now. Even like the latest um, conflict in the region, which was from ISIS. Mm. So, yeah, it's there's many, many forms of torture. Is there anything like in your time of trying to escape? Is there anything that happened that like, really like struck your core differently? Like a, something mm. that might have happened to someone or something yeah. that happened around you. Yeah. Talk on that. Oh, wow. I mean, it really, really recently came back and it kind of brings back, brings in my illness as well. Um, so when we were fleeing, we'd go from village to village and then we kind of have lifts from whoever. It could have been fighters, could have been anyone passing by, but it would have been arranged by known people. And I remember once we were going from one region to another and it was my mum, my brother and myself and we were taken onto a pickup. So you know the pickup truck where you sit at the back and the car bit's at the front but the back bit's open. So it's like a pickup car. Um, we were sitting in that and we were driving. They were driving and then it suddenly stopped and we were kind of stopped by, I think it was around four Kurdish fighters, so Peshmergas, and one of them had been severely, like, just severely injured. I think he was shot from the trigger warning, like shot from the back and all his guts were out. And for two kids to kind of witness that, I do remember just freezing. And I was, I remember so clearly that I was eating my biscuit at the time. And they just came on and just hurled the body in and jumped on and said, we need a ride to the next place. And so we were just faced with this guy screaming with his guts out at the back of the truck. We, we had nowhere to go. We had to just sit there. 
And I remember he kept screaming and like putting his hand out. And as a child, I thought he wanted my biscuit. So I tried to give him my biscuit. And I remember the other guy go smiling, going, no, 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 you're not allowed to give him that. But that memory really, really stuck with me. And it kind of came back in a strange way when I went through my illness and like I've got a stoma bag now and I've had several surgeries. So it started off in this side, went on that side, like it's kind of shifted. But when they put a colostomy on me, like on that side, um, the stoma wasn't healthy. So it looked like I'd been shot. Right. And I had to kind of train myself to change my bag every day. And I, with the previous bag and the current bag, it's completely fine. It looks like a normal, healthy stoma. But that one, the moment they took it off, I was instantly, instantly taken back to that memory. And I just went, I can't do it. There's no way I can change my bag. So they had to... I mean, my large intestine wasn't healthy, so we had to remove it eventually anyway. But it was a direct coloration to, like, my past memory, and it was one of my worst ones. Even though nothing happened to me, it was just seeing that. I mean, you're not meant to see that at the age of four. <laughs> you're not meant to see someone dying with their guts out. Um, but I remember that emotion and that vision very, very clearly. Um, and then other parts of it, there are strangely nice parts of it as well. Like, you know, even though you've got bonds dropping and everything's happening in the background, our parents would kind of do storytelling mm -hmm. and we'd have moments where, you know, reminiscing and we're going to France and they've got flavoured yogurts. When I came here, I realised which flavoured yogurt it was. What flavoured yogurt was it? You know, Petit Foulou. Yeah. Did you get it? Just pull it on the screen. Yeah. Just pull it on the screen. Um, yeah. And but this whole concept of flavored yogurts—it was a whole story time. You know, we're going to France. We're heading to France. Once we get there, we'll eat flavored yogurts, and like all these stories would kind of keep us going. Um, or, or you know, just playing out in nature and going back to smells. I absolutely love the mountains and nature and everything because it does take me back to those memories. And strangely, even though it's not nice memories, I just loved it. And any moment that you burn wood or you do outdoor cooking and you like cook tomatoes and fry onions, instantly that smell takes me back. So you've got good and bad. Um, it's a strange one, but definitely moments that you kind of go back mm. to. So like... How did you get out? How did you, like... So, in, in my mind, like, when you, these pictures are painted, I just see... I just see desert. And, like, not very much else. It's like, where? how do you know... My, my questions are always, like, very much like... Okay, if I'm in that situation, how do I know whether to turn left or right? I think sometimes we just don't even think about even a simple thing like that. And I know that you may not know because you were so young, but how do you, like, how do you know where to go? It's so strange. How do you know where that, the border yeah. is? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, how do you know if it's this way or that way? Like, so much people in this situation or in these situations, wherever they are in the world, probably so many times find themselves walking towards the danger trying to get away from it yeah yeah steep i am um, so i've got i mean one particular recent example in my adult years when i went back and isis was going into the region in in kurdistan um we were trying to go on a helicopter and there was a point where we're driving in the middle of the night and people were driving away from the city but we were driving into so but we didn't know what parts they'd captured and there's a funny story to it, which is a bit longer, but we get to a crossroad and the driver says, I haven't got a clue where to go now because I don't know if they've taken left or if, ta if they've taken over right. And I just went, just go right because it feels right. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know what told me that. 
but thank God we went right because it was the right way and it, it, it was that. And I do believe, I don't know, sometimes you're just, you're just guided without even knowing how and mm. you're protected without even knowing how. In like childhood wise, we ended up being smuggled into Iran. So the smugglers would know the routes exactly and we kind of went on horseback at night time. We were smuggled in. They they kind of know the routes fully. But once we arrived there, we were waiting for my dad. And so Saddam Hussein had hired a husband and wife to poison a group of men. And they were Kurdish. So the husband and wife were Kurdish. And my dad was part of that group. And so when they sat down to eat the food, and food's massive in my culture. Like, you, you feed people. That's our love language. And when they sat down, nobody suspected anything. But the poison was in like, we've got a yogurt drink called Mastal. It's like Ayran. And the men that gulped it down there and then just died on the spot. Wow. And when they realized, oh, two's gone, we've definitely been poisoned. That's when my dad and two other guys were feeling the effects. And so he was critically, critically poisoned and smuggled into Iran to meet us. But as soon as they were smuggled in, um, Amnesty International picked up on the story. And so they flew him to the UK to get medical treatment. I don't know if you remember this, because it's quite a while ago, but they had a Russian spy, Litviengo, who was in hospital. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. It was anthrax or something. Yeah. Was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was like, oh, some type of, put. There was they put some poison in his Lit- food. I remember it was a bald, uh, well, he was bored at the time when I saw him. But yeah, yeah there was a picture of him. In yeah, my dad was exactly the same. It okay. was exactly the same. So his, he had, um, he was poisoned with thallium, but, you know, it was quite big when he came out here, but we had to wait for him to survive and wait for him to kind of be better. But in that time, we were in Iran for about a year. And then after a year, we were reunited and came here. And I don't know, I, I guess as soon as we came here, it was almost like we were in safety. So we had different obstacles to kind of overcome. You kind of, you're here as a refugee. Mm. You're, it, everything is different. Everything. Like I do remember missing our family immensely because we were forced to leave. Like we, we were just, we had no choice but to go. Um, and when you're forced to leave somewhere, you almost leave a piece of your heart still home Mm -hmm. and you're longing to kind of be reunited with your family or your land or your roots and your culture. So I do remember feeling very alienated and quite alone, but then my mum and dad would have been worse because they're adults, right? Mm -hmm. So everyone has different experiences at different points and at their age and it it impacts you differently, I think, with, with what age you're at. Did you ever, did they ever speak about it? No. I mean, this is, this goes back to cultural things, right? So, no, not really. It's more like... Just get on with it. Yeah, just get on with it. We've got something to do. Let's move on. Let's. But for me, I think I wanted to reconnect with my past. And the only way that I was going to reconnect with my past and do the work that I do is if I went on that healing journey and kind of explored that and really faced it, really, really faced it and kind of went deep. Um, But for other members of the family, I don't think that's it as comfortably and they're not interested, which is fine because I believe everyone's in their own journey to kind of experience it in the way that they're comfortable to experience it in their timeline. And... I was meant to kind of confront all of it. If I didn't, I wouldn't be doing what I do now, which kind of is part of the reason why I do what I do. Mm. It's all connected. Um, yeah. It is, um, the yeah, the cultural element of it, I, I definitely understand. I think like, m- you know, my grandparents and stuff like that would never, would never really have spoken too much in detail about stuff that they went through um it's i was actually kind of lucky in um where when my granddad was actually passing away i was like well, just before that i was doing some shopping for him whatever i always got and this was a man who never said it was he never said nothing i had a very interesting relationship with my granddad because 
he was always there. He was always in my life, but he never, I never used to really hear him speak. Yeah. And like, but you know, he was just always there. And like in his time where he started to become like very unwell and that I'm doing shopping and whatnot. One day I just thought, you know what? I don't even know. I don't even know how we got here. I don't even know that. So, um, so I sat down and I asked him and I know that like, because he didn't respond for ages. When I said to him, I was like, granddad, how did you get here? And he did, it took him ages to respond because I know for him, he's like, what, like, what do you mean? That is going to open up a whole conversation that we, we just don't even, you know. And then like, he just told me this most amazing story, but a really deep one. And like, you know, I think for him coming to this country for the first time makes me, made me open up a whole different level of questioning because I think, which would be the same for your parents. They've come, they've experienced a whole madness. And then when they've come here, it's a whole, it's just like a whole another world. Yeah. And you like, everyone kind of gets a, a small sense of that when you first go on holiday. So like when you come out of your, your your own environment and you go Thailand for the first time or you go Nigeria or you go and you step in and you're like, whoa, like it's like a whole different, but when you come from something like traumatic and then you're stepping in here and you don't have it and it's not a nice experience, it's yeah. like, it shapes your reality in so many different types of ways. And obviously I think for more for my granddad when he came here, I think he thought it was gonna be, well, <clears throat> amazing. Yeah. I can like set my family up and I can do whatever and, you know, the first thing that he noticed was that it was dark and black. You know, like all the houses had the chimneys and stuff like that. So yeah. they used to call it the, the the big smoke, I think it was. And like, it was just dark. Like, yeah. That was so, that was super weird to him. For you, like how growing up then here and like experiencing that and still like having such a connection to back home, how did it shape your growing up here? Like making mm. friends, being around people. You know, you said that, like, you were t- trained from young to be quiet at certain times or to hide or to, like... How did that, you know, play a part in, like, your growing up? Well, I mean... And how do you feel that people talk to you being here? Sometimes I... It almost feels like an out of body experience because I, I kind of feel like I fans over there watching me because I, I feel strange reliving but kind of experiencing but also knowing that that happened and I got through it. It's a really surreal feeling. Um, but in terms of growing up, yeah, that was hard. I think the adjustment, people forget how hard it is to kind of readjust to a new culture. I mean, I remember, I'll tell you a story. This is in primary school. So funny, because I remember it so vividly. We didn't speak English. So when we went to primary school, I didn't have a clue what anyone was saying. But I had a friend who would sit with me and almost like love being the teacher. So whatever the teacher taught us, that person would teach me. Alex would teach me. Okay. To kind of go Where was over Alex it. from? Alex was white. Okay. Alex had white blonde hair. Yeah. Um, and so I would take all this in. But we went swimming one day, and I've never been swimming in my life ever. Like, I've, this is a new country. We went swimming, and the boys had to go to one changing room, and the girls had to go to another. And I saw Alex go to the boys. So you followed them? No, I just did not realize. I was like, Alex is a boy. Oh. (laughs) I didn't realise Alex was a boy because his his hair and the way that he looked. I'd never experienced anyone apart from Kurds. Right, okay. Like, coming from my background, I've never seen anyone. Mm. Um, So that, I remember that experience so strongly. Um, Or there are things like, we've got so many funny stories, but we had guests around one day and... No food's big for us, and my mum was like, "Oh, bring the ice cream." And we've kind of bought the tub of ice cream. We've scooped it out, and like, it's not ice cream; it's margarine. Oh. <laughs> but people forget, <laughs> right? Like when you when you're not when you're not from the culture, and you can't read and write, mm. like things like that. 
just will happen so on so many occasions and a little bit later on in primary school I think when I was about eight um I remember I was in the dinner line and this girl had just turned around and said your dad Saddam Hussein no, okay. kids being kids yeah of course I mean, I did understand a lot of English, but I understood your dad. And, and I knew Hussein. what Saddam Hussein was. Yeah. But that really triggered something inside of me as a child where I just wanted to really, really just hit her, basically, as a child. And I didn't know how to verbalise it. I was so angry. And my feelings were, you don't know what I've just been through with my family because of this man and you're calling him my dad. Um... I couldn't say that in words, so I just pushed her. But the teacher saw me push her, and the teacher came over and was really angry. Now, I couldn't even verbalise to the teacher why I was angry and why I'd pushed her. So I got sent to the back of the line. So I, I remember just standing there and just crying and crying, going, this is so unfair, I can't even tell them why I pushed her. But that moment made me realise oh, don't talk about your past. Don't talk about your history with what's happened. Like, this is the moment you're going to try and be as British English as possible. That's it. You're only going to have English friends. You're only going to have British friends. And that, like, you kind of suppress. And I went through my teens trying to suppress my childhood because I was too scared of what it might bring up in terms of reactions from other people. Mm -hmm. Um, so what does that look like? It looks like, like most diasporas that are caught between two cultures, two very strong, prominent cultures. One where, you know, you're not just uprooted, but your father's like politically active and involved and like very staunch nationalistic, patriotic feelings towards being Kurdish. So your Kurdish identity is very much strong in the household and then you're living in in what is a very westernized society and you're kind of stuck between the two of not knowing which way to go and what to do so if i think for my teens it kind of it left me very confused from an identity perspective um i think the repercussions of childhood and like you know my parents were never intentionally not giving love it's situational like how can you think about giving love to anyone when you're about to die right but that need of that child was still not met if you're kind of looking at it from that perspective so because we were constantly fleeing or in fight flight fight and flight mode a lot of things weren't really met and so that i think also came out in my teens where i was almost crying out for help and love and acceptance but doing it in the wrong ways I might have been rebelling I might have been like really rebelling against my parents and then eventually I was like no I just want my parents to love me what should I do I'll, mm. I'll get married really early <laughs> and do the traditional thing so I did that and actually that had a massive impact on my life you know I got married at the age of 19 um it was a very abusive marriage I couldn't get out of it for cultural reasons because it was such a taboo to leave a marriage at that point. And if I look back now, would I say those decisions and those life choices, is it related to my experiences as the child who was, you know, silenced, um, in fear, constantly born into fight and flight mode? 100%. Like you, you kind of, once you don't know what secure love is, you kind of go into that growing period, making those mistakes. Um, so I do, yeah, I do believe it kind of impacted that mm. in various ways. Yeah. Um, it's such a strong level of trauma in it, like that you are, that you're adopting without even realizing it from such a young age. Um, like hearing you speak as well, I I think is your is your dad living still? No, he's passed away. He passed away. Two two thousand ten. Okay, um, sorry to hear that. Thank you. Um, I'm like super curious to like understand as well what it would have been like for them, 
and like even more so your dad like being so strong minded politically and then being away from home now so you get what I'm saying mm-hmm. but then also people still going through what they're going through it must have been like maybe at times whether he exp- whether he expressed it or not sometimes he must have just been bursting to just want to shout something scream something or just go back home or like help someone or yeah oh it's a, it's such a hard one cuz when you cuz you, you don't just come you don't just leave the country and then you're oh, not no, political oh no 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 he was completely political his whole life yeah. he was either a writer a journalist political like he was always but i think that's where for me the strength of our family and the one that kept our family was my mum. Mm. She was the pillar of the family. She was the inner resilience. She was the one that taught us inner resilience. Mm. She was the one that gave everything. My dad was very passionate about his politics, but he was just passionate about his politics. Right. <laughs> and that was the scope that he could kind of, he, he couldn't do anything else. He didn't know how to nurture the kids. He didn't know how to do the healing. He wouldn't go into even contemplating about anything else. It was just the passion. And so your mum had to deal with dealing with all of that passion and anger. And then also raise the family in that on top of that too. So it's like you're taking alone. on alone. Yeah. Yeah. So you're taking on both sides of it. You're taking on that and then you're taking on this. Yeah. And then and then like how many how many siblings is there? So I've got an older brother, younger brother and a younger sister. So there's four. Wow. And then like trying to even tr- figuring out a way to give love to everyone. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's I think yeah, I my mum, I mean, you know, my my dad kind of gets Is your mum living? Them. Yeah, yeah. Thank God. Do you um, talk to her. About oh yeah things, yeah i've started to kind of because everyone has to go at their own pace yeah. she doesn't remember a lot believe it or not that's like, trauma isn't it because she's blocked it out from yeah. trauma she's yeah. like i can't remember that detail i can't remember that detail. Yeah. and they're going how can you not remember mm. um but it's trauma you know when you're not ready to kind of go there and i think some members of my family kind of question like why do you want to go back there why do you want to do the work that you're doing is it not re-traumatizing you are you not constantly being and i think if you started the healing work and the journey it's fine to kind of be exposed to that and relive it and go through it but if you've gone nowhere near it and you've suppressed it and you don't want to go near it that's when it becomes troublesome and quite harder so for everyone i'm just very conscious at what level they're at and i don't really enforce anyone to talk Mm. i'll ask questions and if she knows the answers but she's very much you know i don't want my children to be troubled i think you should carry on and move on and do this and do that like just protection full protection i hear that but isn't there like a subconscious element of like the generational trauma that just you know like even if you even if let's say for example your parents had you here their experience even though your experience isn't the same you got brought up differently and stuff like that yeah there's a part of what they went through that still is within you though right completely i completely believe in generational trauma i've got a 20 year old son he was born here but i'm fully aware that he's carrying all of my trauma Everything has just kind of been passed down through the womb. And actually, you do see it come out in certain ways. And I'm there going, you didn't even experience that. How are you feeling this? And how are you going through that? But I do believe in generational trauma. And sadly, regions where there's been so much conflict, we've almost become numb and desensitized to what's going on, but don't realize that those layers are really seriously impacting our mental health and then to the generations to the next generations and it just carries on so there there needs i really believe there needs to be a big push for like removing that stigma around mental health especially in our community um i don't think mental health is something that's really focused on it's something that's kind of seen as a shame um 
but how can you not experience trauma when you see that level of conflict? Like, how yeah. can you not? Not just as the person that's seen it firsthand, everyone around, you know. For my older brother, he would have experienced it differently in that we were taken away from him. Mm. He saw that, you know. So there's a there's differences in how people have experienced it, but it's still there. And I do believe it's really important to kind of talk through it and it's teaching the older generation and holding their hand going it's all right to talk to talk about it mm. and i think that's what i've been doing with my mum just taking it really slow and going no this is fine this is what it is and you can see it you can see the impact so what did you go through therapy and stuff like that um well i didn't in my earlier years uh believe it or not i went to therapy for the first time properly in 2018 which is very late in life but my health deteriorated um and i i'm i was convinced that my trauma is stuck in my body in my physical body and it's manifesting into an illness and so i really started exploring that and that's when i went into therapy and started talking about all the experiences that would have kind of been held in my body in some shape or form um, so yeah, and it's different forms of therapy. Like I do healing, I do energy healing and whatever works for someone or whatever they're connected to that works for them to help release the trauma, basically. Hmm. Like going through what you've gone through, yeah, it must be like quite tough to hear like sometimes people's views on immigrants and stuff like that, right? Mm. Because... I think it kind of goes back to what, what we were saying before, is that, like, you just... I think a lot of people hear refugee and they just think... They just see a certain type of thing, but they don't necessarily deep the full circumstance. Yeah. And on one hand, you can kind of say, well, you know, like, it's difficult to comprehend when you've never been through it. You know what I mean? If you've never... If it's not been your reality... Uh, and you just keep hearing on a, a certain thing and you can see like why some people just they, they just don't particularly get it but then on the other hand on the other hand it's like super problematic that I guess some people are not necessarily like understanding of what the reality of what some people are actually going through because I've said sometimes mm. I've said yeah like you know what one day, there might be a day, and maybe it's not going to be anywhere in our lifetime yet, yeah, but let's just say one day we got a phone call and we said, or not even a phone call, just an alert that 16,000 soldiers have just landed in Oxford Street right now on complete smoke, on a takeover. Like, that's the reality of some people's lives. We couldn't even comprehend. If I ran someone right now and said, you see in Oxford Street, there's a whole bunch, there's tanks and of the people from a different country that are coming, coming here on a takeover thing. We wouldn't even know where to go and how to react. And I said this on an episode before, but one of my, one of my biggest issues with humanity is that like nobody really understands until it happens to them. Yeah. Like no one really, like when it happens to you, then you, then you will really get it. But until then, that is not going to happen. And then, like, you just have these political issues where, you know, you hear things about refugees and whatever, and then it's, like, it's, like, politically charging. So then yeah. now, all of a sudden, when refugees do come here, then they're treated a certain type of way because of the lack of information that has been given, right? Yeah, yeah. Completely, I think that like the the media and the political agenda has a massive role to play in how people's minds are kind of shaped. In my own personal experience, like when I share my story, even with someone who, you know, doesn't want refugees in this country or doesn't, when they sit down with me and hear it, they're like, oh, wow, I didn't realise that's what you've gone through. But, you know, some people come here to get a job and da 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 I'm there going, hold on, they have every right to come in and get a job. Why not? You know, at the end of the day, if you look at a person from an individual perspective, everyone wants the best for their family. 
whether that's economic, whether that's fleeing from a war, whether that's providing them with a sense of security because they've got more family around here. Like, whatever it is, it's everyone's right to experience that. Why is it that it was okay for many, many years ago for other lands to be invaded and for people to kind of go? Why is it okay for someone now to go, do you know what? I feel like moving to Spain. <laughs> I think I might just go to Spain. It's just, we've got the privilege of that passport to be able to up and leave and make that decision. Not everyone does. Like there are people, I mean, I've got, what, 200 staff in Northern Iraq Kurdistan now that work. They don't have that privilege of going, do you know what? I'm going to take my annual leave and I'm going to go mm -hmm. to X number of countries mm -hmm. for a holiday. Mm -hmm. They don't realise, like, I think lockdown, people hate me for saying this, but I'm happy it happened because it all, but in a way I'm also sad because people have forgotten about it so quickly, so quickly. They've forgotten what it's like to have everything stripped from you. It was the only time, the only moment where everyone in the world got to experience what it's like to have everything taken away from you, right? And the moment we've got everything back, we've just forgotten it all. 100%. Do you know what? I actually think the negative side of it was as well, though. The negative side of, of it was that it was everyone. I think that had it have just been us. Yeah. Had it have just been us, it would have it would have looked a bit different. But I think sometimes when it was everyone, there was this little attitude of like, "Well, do you know what? We're all in it. Like it's just everyone." It's yeah. Like, Wait. You see yeah, when it's that just makes you. Sense. That you makes see sense. when it's just you. Yeah. How, let's see how it is now when it's yeah. just you. Yeah. Now, of course, obviously, in the beginning, we there was a lot of like it did feel like the whole world was going to end or whatever yeah. for like a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right though it like after a while it did it did just become fish and chip paper yeah and like for a day or maybe for a month and yeah look some 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 people went through some really unfortunate circumstances where they lost people and, and whatever yeah. else and stuff and i'm not i'm not bypassing that but i'm like yeah like i don't know i feel like even then see that see that imminent threat of like stepping outside and there might just be a bomb that goes off. Or you might step on one. Not just one. Several. Yeah, yeah. Like, imagine here, you might get the odd bomb that goes off here and there. And, like, we've had a few. But imagine several going off. Regular. Imagine soldiers coming to your house and, you know. Knocking on your door asking for your pups. Or telling you that you got to or leave. Or killing them in front of you. Yeah. Like, it's, like, imagine the worst case scenario. It happens. It's a reality. It happens around the world. But it's very, very difficult for us to kind of grasp it in in, in the world that we live in. Um, I always say, if the world was coming to an end, I'd most probably like to be in Kurdistan because we know how to cope with it better. <laughs> right, I hear that. I am... Um, the whole COVID and the toilet roll situation was just mind blowing for yeah, me. And that... pasta. Yeah. <laughs> pasta. Because you wouldn't have that. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't have that back, you know, everyone there when there's a situation, because we've been through so much conflict and you've seen so much, you help your neighbor. Mm. You help anyone that's in need. You help, like you really do help. Um, Whereas here it really did become, you know, even when the Ukraine war happened, I think everyone started freaking out that it's going to happen here or there's going to be a nuclear bomb that's going to be thrown into the UK or something's going to happen close to home. And that's the first sense of fear to war that I could sense in people around me. Um, but that is sadly a reality of what still goes on in so many people around the world. And actually, when people do come here from another country, believe it or not, they'll end up working to do something so they can go back and help their own community. Yeah. Because, yeah. like, everyone that I know, is exact, that's exactly what they do. Not only do they help the community that they live in here, but they will end up doing something because being part of a diaspora and that connection, you'll always have connection to your roots and you want to give back. So... But I do think it's a lot to do with media and political uh, agenda. 
I think if people were were informed differently, they might have a different view. Like I think if you got a few people that disagreed in a room with a few people who have had experiences and those experiences are shared, it's about education and awareness and kind of that's missing. Um, and that goes back to the media and politics. What type of work are you doing? So I've got a charity for women and girls. We support women and girls impacted by conflict and displacement. And we've got centers and refugee camps in um, Northern Iraq from after the ISIS conflict. So we support the women and girls that are really impacted by ISIS, the um, extreme, you know, sold on as sex slaves. They were raped. Um, you know, that community have had family members killed in front of them. We've got Syrian refugees that have kind of come over from the border. And we implement like projects where we teach them skills. Um, we do educational programs, a lot around mental health. Um, sustainability projects to really just help heal, learn and grow. Because I do believe you can go through really traumatic experiences. But I think with the right tools and the platforms that you really can. I think survivors are some of the strongest people and they can really give back to communities. So it's just helping them get back on their feet and starting to relive. That's great. What does the future look like for Kurdish people? Oh, wow, that's such a big question. I wish Kurd well, Kurds would say, we want to be independent. You know, we want to see a Kurdistan. We want to see an independent country, but is that a reality? I don't know. It's very hard. I think for me, if I go back to my values, I, you know, compassion, kindness, caring. I think that's all I'd ask for is for us to be a bit more compassionate, understanding, um, accepting, caring of each other. Um, I actually wish borders would just be evaporated in one. So there'd be no borders around the world. Um, I wonder what that would look like. Oh, it would be, imagine a world with no borders and no passports where everyone could just move around as they wish. They're like, actually, I want to be somewhere cold. So I'm just going to drive up somewhere cold. Mm. Well, it would take, it would take like generations upon generations to like, do that without conflict, right? Because then obviously, well, you know, you would have some people that would be like, all right, yeah, do you know what? <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen because it no, wouldn't that, work out. <laughs> that is a, that's an interesting thought though because I'm like, I wonder what that would actually look like. That would be, a, in my mind, I just think that would be absolutely sensational. So I had an experience once where I felt like I was in a spaceship with astronauts and I remember that feeling so vividly, like so vividly, you just kind of look down, completely dark in space, but you can see this like blue, green, white dot. And then you realize, wait, they're all humans living there. Mm. Why the hell are they fighting over borders? Why the hell are they fighting over race? Why the hell, like, all these things just kind of come up. And I woke up and cried my eyes out. I cried and cried and cried. Thought that was a really weird experience. There must be something on this. So I did my research. And actually, there's this thing called astronauts awe. It's called what? Astronauts awe. Astronauts so that awe. feeling of like astronauts looking oh, back okay. at Earth, they're in complete awe. Because that's the moment you realize, wait, that's home yeah it's a planet that is home wow. it's not that single house or that single country or that single that is home right. and we're all in it it's all our i think that's the closest thing that i've had in terms of feeling like a world with no borders and passports yeah is that feeling of astronauts or and i i'm like there's only 700 astronauts in the world have <laughs> actually experienced it yeah for real um but yeah now honestly like this has been very interesting thank um, you to hear you like talk in such like depth about what you've been through in your perspective and stuff like that and i um like 
I'm really appreciative of you, of you coming here and doing that. Thank and you. And also, as well, like, well done on the work that you're doing. I know that it's a, it's a never-ending thing, innit? It doesn't have an end to it, really, no. does it? <laughs> but it's helpful to so many people. Um, Thank you so much. And it much. will be like, you know, for so many of them, you know, it, it makes a difference. You get what I'm saying? And if... I guess sometimes that's all you kind of want to do in life sometimes, right? If you could just make a difference, even if it's just one person's life, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're contributing. And, um, and that's amazing. Thank Is you. there anything, one thing that everyone needs to know about? So, like, it could be a book you've read, a documentary you've seen, a film you've watched. Um, it could be anything as well. It doesn't have to be on topic. Like, anything that you thought was interesting that you feel people need to know about? Could be a brand as well, anything. Have you seen anything? Wow, there's so much. I mean, obviously go check out on the Lotus Flower charity, but I think seeing as we were talking about the last subject of astronauts all, I would encourage everyone to go out and listen to Carl Sagan's The A Pale Blue Dot. It's a, you can find it on YouTube. But once you listen to that, it just makes sense. This is the world that we live in, and it's it's one small pale dot. Um, and his speech on that is to, it makes me cry every time I listen to it.